I'm up, I guess. <laughs> Good yeah, afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to see you all here today. And I hope you're taking good care of yourselves and your families. Connecting graduate admissions and graduate student success is a timely topic because we're always focused on recruiting and admissions at this time of the academic year, or we should be. Our strategic plan clearly articulates that graduate education is a priority for us and to be able to strengthen and expand our graduate programs, we must learn how to do a better job recruiting our next class of graduate students. And as we consider what that means, we really need to consider non-traditional ways to think about graduate admissions. The world is certainly changing and recruiting a diverse pool of students really will require some different thinking, especially during these, during these unusual times. So I wanna thank Dr. Kudali and his staff for organizing this virtual event. And also I wanna thank you all for taking the time to zoom in here this afternoon. I think you probably feel as I do that I'm tired of zooming and <laughs> this is the way we do things these days. And um, certainly it is a productive way to have a meeting if you can't meet face to face. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Stevens and uh, WKU campus community. Greetings from the Graduate School. Today, uh, we are excited to kick off a new initiative called Grad Learn. Grad Learn is a webinar or workshop series sharing information from external constituents about evidence-based practices to promote innovation and excellence in graduate education. As the Provost had indicated, we are, uh, interested in both undergraduate and graduate edu education and strength strengthening those, especially during these uncertain times. So the first webinar is aptly titled Connecting Graduate Admissions and Graduate Student Success and is organized in partnership with Educational Testing Services, ETS, the parent company of the Graduate Record Examination, GRE. We are deeply grateful to the ETS team that include Dr. Alberto Asireta, Ms. Don Piacentino, the Director of Global Higher Education at ETS, Mr. Ken Ballas, the Executive Director for Academic Partnership at ETS, who is joining in this uh, Zoom session, Ms. Catherine Fields Schulz, who is the Regional Director of Academic Partnerships. Before I introduce our distinguished presenter, Dr. Maxson, and the panel member, I'd like to again thank Provost Stevens for her continued and strong support of graduate education. It is truly an honor and privilege for me to introduce Dr. Maxson, our presenter today, and Mr. Matthew Bashi Kadlubowski, um, who will be on the panel taking questions and providing insights and perspectives from ETS. Dr. Maxson is a professor of biology and served as Dean of the Graduate School at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill from 2008 to 2019. Dr. Maxson currently serves as a part-time graduate education advisor in the Office of Graduate Education Engagement at ETS. In 2018, Dr. Matson received the highest honor from the Council of Graduate Schools for his tireless advocacy for graduate education and got an excellence award for promoting graduate education. Mr. Matthew Bashi Kadlubowski is the Associate Director for Academic Support Services in the Global Higher Education Division at ETS and he's responsible for outreach, communication, and training of the GRE program clients within the United States and Canada. The Western community, Dr. Matson, is excited to listen to your presentation. Uh, please do uh, mute uh, your microphones uh, and please do provide your comments uh, and questions in the chat box. And we will try to make this a more of a conversation rather than a monologue. With that said, Dr. Maxson, we look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Ranjit. It, it really is a pleasure to be with all of you today. So just a couple of um, you know, housekeeping things um, while you can still see me. Um, Matt um, Bashi Kadlubowski is with us today to answer technical questions about DTS or the GRE that uh, I may be unable to answer. I'm really here as uh, um, an advisor who has used 
the GRE, who has spent time on the GRE board and the TOEFL board over the last several years and spent a number of years as graduate dean, as Ranjit uh, indicated. And I couldn't be more delighted to be here. I am happy to have you interrupt me. Remember to unmute when you want to interrupt, but I'm happy to have you interrupt me so that this can be a little bit more like a conversation. I will tell you that my students do it all the time and it's never a problem. You could also use the uh, hand raise tool as well as I can generally see that also. Um, and uh, perhaps Scott or Ranjit can uh, monitor the chat if you're putting questions in the chat and let me know when they're there. But feel free to interrupt. I'm happy to have you do that. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that uh, you'll be able to see the slides um, that we have prepared for you today. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're gonna focus on connecting graduate admissions and graduate student success. Um, and this is an area in which I've had some some experience over the last several years. And what I want to do is start with just a bit of an overview. We're going to, I'm going to break the presentation into six pieces, not of equal length. Uh, and I'm going to begin by talking about some experiences um, that I had recently while I was dean at here in Chapel Hill. Um, and these experiences involve the GRE and efforts to diversify graduate programs. And I hope to be able to share with you some of the lessons learned from that. And then I'm gonna talk about some recent efforts that ETS has made to further engage with the graduate education community. It's not that they haven't been engaged in the past, but they're, they're reaching out even more at this time. I wanna then move into a presentation on using holistic admissions and really give you some insight on how to use holistic admissions and um, point you to some, a number of resources you can use if, as you begin to engage in more holistic admissions processes. I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about the value of the GRE and the validity evidence um, that exists for the GRE exam itself. And then we'll talk about increasing access and equity for applicants where ETS has really done a remarkable job over the last several months. And finally, um, I wanna share with you just a little bit about ETS and its commitment to diversity. Uh, in many of the conversations we have with individuals, we find out that, uh, that they don't know much about ETS as an organization. And I, I hope to uh, provide you with some of that information today. So I'm gonna begin, as I said, with some practical experiences from UNC Chapel Hill. These occurred during my time as Dean here. And uh, I'm gonna focus on two programs in particular, the nursing program and um, our biomedical and uh, biological sciences program. And I think they're gonna provide you with some insight uh, in, into both holistic admissions and the role the GRE exam can or uh, can play uh, in that process. So I want to start by indicating the standard that I think we all hope to meet when we bring a student in to our graduate programs. And that's we'd like, that is we would like to have the student complete the program. We all know about efforts that have been made over the years to increase the number of underrepresented students, for example. Um, that are admitted to a program, but then we often fall short on efforts to have them complete the program. And this really doesn't represent success. Once we have them in as part of the program, we'd like to see them complete the program. So most of the time here at UNC, we've spent time thinking about how do we get them into the program and changing admissions processes as necessary to do that. Um, in the case of the nursing program, they chose to waive the GRE requirement. And I will talk a little bit about the impact of that. Um, and in the case of the biological and biomedical sciences program, they moved over the course of a few years to a more holistic review of their applications while retaining the GRE. 
one of the key things that we have learned and that we have tried to focus on is retention of our students. Uh, we've tried to put as much emphasis on what we do to retain a student in a program <clears throat> as we do on thinking about how are we going to recruit and admit students to our programs. And so I'll share a little bit of what we're doing with regard to that. Um, we have a, a pro program up in medical school called Training Initiatives in Biomedical and Biological Sciences, um, which is available to everybody in our BBSP program or our Biomedical Biological Sciences program. And then the graduate school has a diversity and student success program, which is available to all graduate students. So let me talk a little bit about the nursing program. So like many nursing programs across the country, um, our nursing program admits students to three different degrees, the doctor of nursing practice, uh, the PhD in nursing and a master's degree in nursing. And in, 2014, the School of Nursing approached the graduate school and asked for permission to waive the requirement for a GRE exam. And their intended goal was to increase student diversity within the program. Uh, their belief being that the GRE exam was a barrier um, to diversity. And at that time, they had about 20% or so of uh, any given uh, new class of students, particularly in the master's program, who were uh, underrepresented minority students, and they felt they could, uh, could increase that. Um, they intended to look at the undergraduate GPAs for their admitted students and also take a careful look at uh, whether or not students from, were, from the master's program were able to pass the licensure exam as a way to ensure that they weren't admitting uh, you know, students that, uh, they, they wanted to ensure that they were admitting the same high quality students that they had in the past. Well, they immediately saw uh, about a threefold increase in applications to the master's program not so much of an increase to the DNP or the PhD, a little bit of a bounce, but not a tremendous bounce, but a very significant bounce in applications to the master's program. And frankly, they weren't prepared for that and they didn't know exactly what to do with all of those numbers, but they muddled through the first year and um, they admitted a class that had a slightly higher undergraduate GPA, um, but they didn't really have a class where there was any significant increase in diversity of the class of admitted students. And frankly, they didn't have much increase in diversity of the applicant pool. So unfortunately, um, they weren't really achieving the goals that they had intended. And that was evaluated about four years into this effort to, uh, to waive the GRE and potentially increase the, the, uh, the diversity of both the pool and the students admitted. As I said, they did see a slightly higher undergraduate GPA for the matriculated students, um, but I would tend to interpret that to mean that they were simply using an undergraduate P, uh, GPA um, as a way to evaluate their students and put more weight on that than they had when they had both the GRE and the undergraduate GPA. Interestingly, um, the bump in numbers of applications only lasted a couple of years. And by year three, they were down to a, a situation that was very similar to the number of applicants they had before. And again, there wasn't much of an increase in the, uh, the diversity of the applicant pool. So in this case, it didn't really, um, deciding to waive the GRE didn't have the, the uh, outcome that they had hoped for and had anticipated. Uh, they are still waiving the GRE at this point in time. Um, part of that due, is due to COVID. Um, and it is still, as far as I'm aware, aren't uh, achieving any greater success than they were um, two years ago. So let me turn now to biological and biomedical sciences. Uh, this program took a very different approach um, first of all, it's important to understand that the BBSP program 
is an umbrella admissions program that admits students um, for the first year and um, works together with those students for the first year. And then all of those students disperse into 14 different PhD programs. So they don't really graduate from the BBSP program, but they are admitted through the BBSP program to um, all of our, essentially all of our um, science programs within the medical school and two or three of the science programs in the College of Arts and Sciences, including the biology department. They see about 1,500, somewhere between 1,500 and 1,800 applicants a year. Um, and they graduate on the order of 100 students from those 14 different programs each year. So they have a pretty extensive data set um, in terms of the students they've admitted and the students they have graduated. And they decided to begin to look at all of the data they had to see if they could determine what predicts completion, what predicts success, depending on how you choose to define that, what predicts productivity. And what they wanted to do was improve their admission process. Um, they started with the assumption that admissions is not perfect um, and there should, be at least, there should be some way to improve it that um, every aspect of the admissions process needs to be looked at. And during the course of those conversations, they began to realize they would need to spend as much time discussing student support as they were, were spending discussing the admissions process. And so they began to look carefully at their data sets. And I'm gonna show you just one of, of the metrics that they chose to evaluate. Since publishing is the coin of the realm in biological and biomedical sciences, they determined they, that they would measure productivity um, for each of the students in the program uh, in terms of papers published. And so they binned their students into to four different bins. They had a group of students who had three or more first author papers another bin containing students with one to two first author papers, another bin with students who had no first author papers, but a middle author paper, and then finally students who had um, no papers at all. And they compared where those students were, which bin they were in, with a number of metrics or a number of, of pieces of the application that uh, we use for admissions. And they very quickly discovered that undergraduate GPA did not predict productivity. It was just as likely to have a student with a low GPA and high productivity as it was to have a student with a high GPA from their undergraduate work and low productivity. They also discovered that GRE scores did not predict productivity in terms of papers published. They had um, students with relatively low GRE scores, but realizing that they had been admitted, so their scores weren't that low, um, who were productive and students with very high GRE scores who were less productive. Um, even the duration of research experience that these students had as undergraduates didn't predict their productivity as graduate students. One might have thought that that would be a wonderful indicator but it turned out not to be so. Um, it, recommendation ratings that they received in the letters of recommendation seem to be the most reliable predictor of whether or not a student was going to be productive, but even that wasn't, uh, wasn't a perfect predictor. So the conclusion was nothing was going to predict productivity um, directly, and in fact, not any real surprise there. None of the metrics that they measured, and they measured a number of other metrics, completion of the program, um, you know, overall GPA, whether or not they passed qualifying exams easily, all of those things. There was nothing that really predicted that uh, in a way that uh, was it indicated that that should have a, a more prominent role in determining who would be admitted. Of course, you know, the the metric I've shared with you here is just one of many, and um, 
many people will disagree with the idea that this is the most important thing to measure. And of course, it, it differs with different programs. So in view of this, they decided that they were going to adopt a more holistic approach to their admissions process. Um, we all want- I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Batson? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to take you up on that offer interrupt you if that's okay. Absolutely, please do. Um, on the previous slide, I was just curious. Um, you know, it seemed like you, you said that there weren't really any great predictors except for uh, recommendation ratings were the most reliable. Um, I think those are probably also the most potentially biased. So how did that affect diversity? <laughs> well, so you're absolutely right. Um, everything has its biases and certainly um, a letter's recommendation can be as biased or more biased than anything else. So the reality is that uh, jumping sort of to the end, what they adopted was an holistic approach that used everything and with that sort of approach, and I'll outline you know, how they did that um, here in just a moment, with that approach, they were able to increase diversity. Um, but it was only by using everything and not cherry picking. So to adopt that holistic admissions approach, what, um, what they decided to do was first, um, they wanted to educate their faculty about the non-productive measures or non-predictive measures of either success or completion or productivity that were at that point being used. So in other words, they shared a lot of this information that I just shared a portion of with you and said, these aren't going to predict whether or not a student is productive and they're not going to predict whether or not a student completes. And so you need to weigh that in the admission decision. It's not a matter of not using them. It's just don't overly rely on them as predicting whether or not your students will be successful. Um, they educated all of the members of the committees about um, implicit bias. That wasn't being done in the, in the past. And I will say that this approach of sitting down with the um, admissions committees every year and discussing um, implicit bias and discussing how various aspects of the um, uh, application should be used occurs every single year with every admissions committee. They, they don't um, just do this once and then not worry about it. And another thing they did, which I thought was very interesting, it took a while to get to this place, but ultimately they removed the undergraduate GPA and the GRE scores from the student dossiers for the interviewers. The way the admissions process works for this program is they have admissions committees that are looking at various bins of students. As you can imagine, biological and biomedical sciences is very broad. And so they bin students into somewhat narrower categories, typically five or six of those categories and have an admissions committee for each one. And those committees um, consider all aspects of every single application and arrive at a group of students that are gonna be brought onto campus for interviews. Um, as I said, they typically have somewhere between 1,500 and 1,800 applicants, and they usually interview about 300 on campus. Um, and what they did was they, they use a different group of people to do the interviews. And they remove the GRE and the GPA scores from the student dossiers that they provide to the interviewers and ask that the interviewers focus on what it is the students want to do. What research do they want to do? Why do they want to come to the University of North Carolina? Why have they decided to go to graduate school? Many of those things that um, it's really important to focus on, um, but often get lost in um, the nature of the interview when, when a faculty member wants to focus on, you know, why did you get a certain grade in this undergraduate course? None of that information is available and it has really changed the tone of the interview. Uh, the only other thing that I would do if I was changing this is I would go to some sort of standardized interview um, for each of these um, students. But it has had um, an enormous impact in terms of changing the nature of that interview. Everybody agrees. So how did it all work? Well, they began training in 2014 for the 2015 season. As I said, they train every year. And at that point, um, 
the fraction of underrepresented minority students that were coming into the class was averaging about 15% or so over the four years prior to when they began the training. Um, the first year, um, the admission of underrepresented minority students rose to 26%. And it increased to just above 30% in the 2019 cycle. So they're running very close to admitting a third of the class um, as underrepresented uh, minority students. And the retention and completion of those students is identical with that of the majority students. And so I would say that they have been incredibly successful in their efforts to diversify. And they have done it while using the GRE. Now, I will say that they have subsequently um, waived the GRE requirement and whether or not they'll reinstitute it further down the road is unclear. Um, many of the biological and biomedical programs across the country have waived the GRE, um, many of them in an effort to increase diversity. Whether or not they're meeting that goal, I can't say in other programs, but I can tell you this program is meeting that goal and they did it while using the GRE as part of their process for evaluating. So they've developed a set of recommendations for file review, which are you know, laid out for you here uh, in bullet format. And the first is do not assign undue predictive power to undergraduate GPA or GRE scores. And what that means is don't create a spreadsheet where you've got some, you're using some algorithm to evaluate those two numbers. And then you have a cutoff line and any student below that is not evaluated further and any student above that is evaluated further. Um, that, um, ascribes undue predictive power to both the undergraduate GPA, which has its own set of issues, and the GRE scores. So first thing is don't do that. Um, consider the relevant experience um, of the student, particularly when that's coupled with an enthusiastic support letter. Um, look at that thoughtfully and carefully, recognizing it has its own set of biases. Importantly, determine the criteria for admission in advance. What is it that you're trying to achieve? Um, you know, each program may have a slightly different set of goals um, with regard to admission. So have those conversations before you start looking at the files. Train the com committees on implicit bias. I know that is sometimes controversial and not everybody agrees with that approach, but uh, it seems to have worked for many of our faculty here. And before you begin reviewing files, consider ways that you might assess non-cognitive qualifications that you think are important for your particular graduate students. You know, things like motivation, perseverance or grit, um, the adaptability um, that's necessary to succeed in graduate school. And finally, one of the things I think that this program has demonstrated very nicely is that it is possible to read every application and the entire application and to do that at scale. I will admit that they have a lot of faculty involved in the process, and that may be a challenge for some programs, but I've also um, you know, been around as graduate dean long enough to know that there are um, not that many programs that get an enormous number of applications. And I'll make some suggestions for how even those programs can adopt a more holistic um, set of review processes. So finally, I do want to make a couple of comments about student support, which we found to be just as important in terms of making sure students completed. Remember, I said the goal was for our students to complete the program. So you need to spend time and effort in making sure that that happens. And we support our students up in the medical school and then in the BBSP program um, through a training program called TIBS, Training Initiatives in Biomedical and Biomedical Sciences. This provides a lot of, uh, of professional development, a fair amount of counseling. It creates a community among the students, um, all of which are important for their success. Uh, that effort is supported by the School of Medicine, 
by an IMSD grant and by uh, a previous UN uh, NIH best award. Um, so there is grant support behind it. And I recognize that not every program is gonna be able to amass that level of financial support. Um, they actually have an office up in the medical school that includes seven full-time staff that work through this program uh, to support their students. And I've indicated here what that uh, office focuses on. Now, and as I said, I do recognize that not every program can, uh, can muster that level of support. So I think the, the take home message here is that spending time thinking about how you're gonna support these students is just as important as admitting them. And I think you'll be very pleased with the, the overall uh, impact when you recognize that not only are you admitting um, a more diverse student population, but that they are able to succeed in your programs um, because you have spent time thinking about how you're gonna support those students. So those are my two vignettes from um, UNC Chapel Hill. And now I, I wanna turn to talk just for a couple of minutes about um, the engagement um, ETS is making with the graduate education community. And uh, the first thing I'll do is mention um, the Office for Graduate Education Engagement. So I am with you this afternoon in sort of a unique role. I'm representing ETS, as uh, Ranjit mentioned, um, but I'm also hopefully bringing my own experience as uh, a long-serving graduate dean who's no longer in that position, but spent many years as dean of the graduate school. Um, and in a graduate school that oversees programs across the university. A little over a year ago, ETS created the Office for Graduate Education Engagement. And the individuals that were brought on as some um, part-time advisors in that office come from a broad range of institutions and with a broad range of backgrounds, as you can see, um, here on this slide. I won't talk about each individual. You can just uh, take a look. The most important thing is that ETS has thought carefully about the past experience each individual has, and they have thought about the different kinds of schools that they come from. And uh, we have quite a, a robust office and quite, uh, quite lively discussions when we get together each week to talk about um, graduate education. Uh, the GRE board is another group that is absolutely committed to the, to the success of graduate education and the success of our students. And one of the things I think people don't think enough about is that the GRE board is all of you. It's made up of mostly deans and faculty um, who are involved every day with graduate education. It's an independent board with members appointed by the Association of Graduate Schools, which is the, A, the AA, represents the AAU schools and the Council of Graduate Schools, which represents schools across, uh, across the country and including Canada and a number of international schools. And it oversees the GRE test and services and the research um, all associated with the GRE program. It's another aspect of the GRE program that I don't think people um, fully realize is the amount of research um, that the GRE program puts into the exam that they share and administer. There are a number of standing committees on the GRE board and you're seeing um, the board leadership over on the right-hand side of the slide at this point in time. Then the GRE board itself and the various committee members are shown here, including uh, your own dean, who is a member of the GRE board. Uh, obviously, every, the individuals on the board come from a wide range of institutions and an extraordinary range of backgrounds. And as I said, they advise the GRE in terms of the exam, in terms of diversity and inclusion processes uh, and any number of things that may come up. In 2019, 
the GRE program worked to expand its expertise on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and brought the three individuals indicated here um, in as advisors specifically for the DEI initiatives uh, within ETS and uh, being carried out by the board. And each of these individuals has a long history of work in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And finally, I wanna to touch on the team-based approach that GRE is currently, uh, or ETS, I should say, is currently using. I have already talked about the Office for Graduate Education. I wanna say a few words about the Academic Partnerships team, which has recently been created um, to explore opportunities and synergies to align the ETS mission um, and its advancement of quality and equity in education um, to the partner um, colleges and universities that ETS serves with a goal of developing um, new products, new services, new approaches. Um, ETS really wants to to reach out beyond what it's known for. It is known for the GRE exam. It wants to reach well beyond that and begin to provide opportunity within the entire graduate life cycle, from recruiting graduate students, through admitting graduate students, to retaining graduate students, and on to um, seeing that they have career opportunities that are appropriate for the degree they've attained. And then the academic support team um, is there to help graduate schools and programs with training regarding the GRE and various services and best practices in holistic admissions. Um, Matt is with us today as part of that support team and is always available to all of you um, for any questions you may have about um, ETS services and any support that they might provide. So I would encourage people to certainly think about reaching out. Now I'm gonna stop at that point and see if there are any questions from any of you with regard to anything we've covered um, up to this point in time. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment so I can see you and you can see me and um, encourage you to ask some questions. We've talked about a number of different things. Um, are there questions? I have something. Hi, Dr. Matson. Um, you know, the case studies that you provided were really interesting and you kind of just hit on what we we already know in the organizational sciences which is performance and productivity aren't predicted by any one thing they're predicted by a multitude of things and there's some recent meta-analytic evidence that suggests that having a research experience is not predictive of graduate student performance or success or productivity, but rather it's the specific tasks and knowledge, skills, abilities, and, and other things that students have gained from their undergraduate experience, which is more predictive of student success. So going beyond a GRE score and going beyond the GPA, um, even going beyond letters of recommendation. So really it seems like academia is trying to catch up to what we already know in organizational sciences, which is, it's not just one thing, it's not even just two things, it's a multitude of things that will predict success and performance. What a wonderful um, segue into what we're gonna talk about next, which is holistic admissions. And you couldn't be more correct, that's absolutely true. Um, in fact, if there was anything that we've looked at over the years that might um, reasonably predict success um, in graduate school, it's mentorship and, and the quality of mentoring that a student receives. Of course, you can't evaluate that as part of the admission process. Um, and so you're, you're right, looking at everything, and that is really what holistic admissions is all about. It's looking at everything, figuring out how you want to weigh all of those things, where in the process you want to evaluate them, and really try to determine what the student can bring and what sort of background experiences they've had. And it may not be research um, that will add to their ability to successfully complete a graduate degree. Um, yes, 
we may be catching up with disciplines that have already figured this out, but it's a it's about time, and and we're happy to be able to have that conversation um, with people and have them begin to think about doing things in a little bit different way. This is a good time to do that. Thanks for that comment. Other question. Hi, Dr. Madsen. My name is Nikki. I did have a quick question. What are some suggestions that you think might be viable for programs that aren't particularly heavy in research? So let's say an undergrad didn't have a research opportunity. Now we're knocking out the GRE, we're knocking out GPA. Um, what do you think would be a good holistic <laughs> approach? Um. Yes, I like the comment, knocking out uh, GRE and knocking out GPA. And I presume you're saying you're knocking out GPA because? Theoretically speaking. I see. Well, this is where I think it be, it's incumbent on the program to try to evaluate for themselves what sort of characteristics, I mean, you've taken kind of all the numbers out of it, so what characteristics do you seem to, do you believe are the most important characteristics for students that you have had succeed in your program? And then these are, it's not gonna have anything to do necessarily with uh, GPA, might have to do with the undergraduate curriculum they followed, but not necessarily the GPA. But what characteristics are, are important and how can you evaluate those to the best of your ability? Uh, one of the things that some programs have um, thought about doing is asking for a more, um, uh, providing the students with more direction in terms of the letter of intent that they may provide as part of an application or providing individuals who are being asked to write letters of recommendation with more direction in terms of what they would like what the program would like to hear about the student, so that they are, at least in some cases where they're paying attention, they're providing you with more of that information um, that you need to make a decision based on what you have decided is important. Those sorts of things can help create a more holistic process and a process that is, in fact, allowing you to evaluate those things that you think are important. So I hope that's helpful. It was. Thank you very much. This is actually coming from a support professional who has recommended multiple times to um, different programs that we might want to consider moving away from the data-driven admission. And I do appreciate, you know, suggestions on how to segue and suggest that that might be done as opposed to just uh, taking away traditional metrics and saying, you know, find some way else to do it. I'd like to be able to give them uh, some type of plan. Right. And, and I think that's one way to think about it. Hopefully some of what I'm going to share with you now will also uh, provide some additional um, thoughts for you. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and uh, really begin to talk about uh, holistic admissions and some approaches to use. So first, let's define holistic admissions. It's really about considering all the information that you have to get the most complete picture you can of the applicant and what they can bring to the program. And there are you know, a number of things that we typically use um, within our applications. Some people are eliminating some of them, but the undergraduate record, that may include the grades, but it's certainly, um, you know, there's a, a, a curriculum the student followed. There's a reputation of the undergraduate program. There's standardized test scores like the GRE and the TOEFL letters of recommendation, personal statements, uh, internship and work experience, research experience, um, and demographics um, for many of us are important aspects of that application. And what holistic admissions is not is a situation where you are considering everything, where you have decided to eliminate the GRE, um, but you're not considering everything that you have available. In reality, a holistic admissions considers everything. And that would include standardized test scores because each and every part of the application, as one of your colleagues just so nicely indicated, each and every part of the application informs you with regard to something. Don't use cutoff scores. Um, 
that's never appropriate. And give some thought to how you want to weight the various components of the application. You know, so it's not just what information is considered, but how it is considered. And um, I'll mention the order in which it's considered as well. So in 2018, ETS went out and interviewed a significant number of graduate deans and faculty in a variety of universities across the country and came up with a set of promising practices for holistic application review from those interviews. And that was based on research in the literature, but, but primarily based on interviews with these individuals as uh, ETS talked about with them, about how they, how they how they did their admissions, how they used the exam, how they used other components of the application process. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about what was learned. Um, and ETS has curated all of this, and it's all available for you on the web. So you can actually uh, access all of this information. So one of the first things to do is have the program work together to set goals and strategies um, to achieve those goals. Um, you have to agree before you start reviewing files on what the goals for the program are and how you might achieve those. And that includes thinking about how you're going to recruit students that you want to recruit. So if you're looking to um, increase um, a particular population of students, um, either it might be international students, it might be underrepresented minority students. How are you going to recruit those students? And how are you going to evaluate those students as um, applicants for your program? You need to think about this ahead of time and then determine the role and importance of each component of the applicant's file in assessing those things that you have agreed are important for success. And in the process of doing these interviews, um, ETS discovered that often the committees, the, the group of individuals at each um, university that were being interviewed, um, they commented on the fact that ETS was asking questions that they hadn't thought to ask in the past or hadn't asked in a long time. And so ETS has put together something called questions to consider um, that can spark a lot of thinking about holistic admissions in your institution. And I would uh, commend this to you as something you might want to look at as you're beginning a conversation about holistic admissions. <laughs> Secondly, they learned that um, communicating the application review and selection process so all decision makers understand is critically important. That everybody involved has to agree on what the enrollment goals are, what the strategy is to meet those goals, and the process that will be used in meeting those goals. They also have to agree on how to evaluate each component of the application. And that includes not only you know, what information are you trying to take from that part of the application, um, but where in the process of reviewing the application are you gonna review that piece of information? So for example, it's well known that there can be a bias associated with looking at, um, say, undergraduate institution first uh, in terms of how you look at everything else. If you believe that institution is a high flyer, you may inflate your overall thinking about the remainder of the items that you review. If you think it is an institution um, that is, you know, inferior to yours and to other institutions that that then everything that you look at after that may be deflated because of that the impact of looking at that particular item first so think about order of review and um you know i would recommend trying to to do that in a way that 
that you are not allowing some of those things with, with the greatest bias to um, influence how you look at the other items in the application. Um, you need to talk about how to mitigate unconscious bias. Um, and you need to talk about how um, disagreements are gonna be resolved. And one of the key things that can be done as well, which is to communicate to applicants the process you're using to review the application. Um, and that was actually recommended um, by Barbara Lovitz in her book, Making, Implicit, Making the Implicit Explicit. Better communication among the committee members, but also better communication with the applicants so that they are more likely to provide you with the information that you're looking for in the application to help you make a decision about um, admission. Dr. Matson, uh, yes. may I ask a question? Certainly. This is from Dr. Marilyn Gardner. So we all have this ambitious goal of increasing diversity. So the question is, are we allowed to look at demographics when making an admission decision? And the second part is, how can we ensure that ensure this does not lead to allegations of discrimination? So, yeah. So, it, yes. Um, most of the programs I'm aware of that are, are doing holistic admissions are looking at demographics, um, although they are trying to do it in a fair way so it doesn't lead to um, allegations of discrimination. And one way to think about that is to ensure that you do not set um, a goal so you don't indicate that, well, we want 10% of our class or 30% of our class or whatever that may be to be underrepresented minority, never articulate that and don't set that as a goal. Just indicate that you are gonna take all aspects of the application into consideration, which would include um, the demographic aspects of the application. You know, they may be first generation students. They may, you know, whatever it is that you're looking at. So I hope that helps a little bit. That's how we have done it. So we, we do think about that, but we don't set a, a goal with regard to that. And that has served us pretty well. Um, so when you're reviewing multiple components, even use multiple components when you're narrowing the pool. Don't go to this place where you are using just GRE scores or just undergraduate GPA or some combination of the two with some magic arithmetic that's done to come up with, uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday he said, well, my program used to come up with what they called a Q score, which in some way, you know, took the undergraduate GPA and the GRE and, and merged them. So they came up with a number and um, you know, students above a certain Q score were considered and students below were not considered. Um, avoid that sort of use of, of just the numbers. And if you're using score guidelines, which many people do, undergraduate GPA and, and GRE, add another component in that initial review. Uh, at least one, maybe two, so that you are looking at something beyond just those numbers where you are still collecting those. Um, you can think about trying to quantify traditionally qualitative components. Um, we're doing something similar right now in um, our effort to, uh, we have a, a, a faculty position open and we are trying to quantify um, certain aspects of a person's application that aren't normally um, quantified. Um, you know, just with a zero, one or two um, as an indicator of whether or not they're satisfying it. But again, it's a committee decision as to how those are looked at. Um, align, if you, if you choose to use a rubric, and many programs do, but some don't, if you're using a rubric, align the rubric weighting to the goals of the program. Think about how you're rating each individual component of that rubric. Um, you know, for your program, research may be very important. For other programs, it may be something else entirely. Uh, review the components in the order of priority based upon your enrollment goals. As I said, don't necessarily, don't let certain aspects of the um, materials, the application, uh, the applicant has provided um, it bias, which you review after that. And, in, you know, consider changing your review process totally. Doing something very different. Have a real conversation about what you're looking for and how you might 
find that. Of course, diversifying the admissions committee is always a good idea. Um, it is really useful to have members on the committee who have had different experiences, who have attended different kinds of institutions so that your committee isn't all made up of the same kind of individual. This provides the faculty on the committee with an opportunity to learn something about less familiar schools, especially uh, minority serving institutions, MSIs, HBCUs. Um, and in some cases, um, I know many committees have actually had current students sitting on the admissions committee. They may not have a vote, but they have a full voice in thinking about aspects of the application. And that can be incredibly useful to the faculty, particularly if those students um, are part of that group of students that you're trying to attract and bring into your program. They can share important insights about aspects of the application that, um, the, that the faculty committee members may not be seeing. Um, consider ways to set criteria that would allow applicants to be included in the review rather than excluded. I would argue that we have spent most of the last 30 or 40 years thinking about how we can exclude people rather than include people in our graduate programs. And just a simple change, I know it's hard to do, but a simple change of thinking about how can this student enhance my program instead of thinking about how can I quickly exclude this student can have a remarkable impact. So if you're using GRE scores and uh, undergraduate GPAs to make that first cut in your applications, then add it at, at least one more criteria, something that you think will reveal something important about whether or not a student will succeed. Um, it might be their letter of intent. Um, it might be some aspect of their experience as an undergraduate student. Um, it can be any of those things, but add another, another criteria, something beyond the GRE and the GPA. And each applicant then is gonna have multiple chances to be placed into the review pool. Um, so you're, you're focusing on including students rather than excluding students. And <clears throat> consider the GRE has a positive indicator of an applicant's preparedness for graduate study, um, not as a potentially negative indicator. Um, we have had a lot of conversations over the last few years <clears throat> about using the GRE to indicate where a student might um, need some remedial work when they come into the program, where otherwise they are, you know, extraordinary applicants for the program, but uh, there are aspects of the GRE that um, may be low or inconsistent with other elements of the application. Um, so think about it as a positive indicator uh, and an indicator of, of whether or not the student's gonna succeed in your program. Um, not necessarily complete, but how they're going to, you know, come into the program and be able to do graduate level work. I have a faculty member here who would never consider not using the GRE um, because he said it is an indicator of whether or not the students are able to do the level of work that needs to be done in the program. He's not using it as an indicator of whether or not the student will have a high GPA in graduate school or do a wonderful research project. He is just using it as an indicator of whether or not they have the background. Um, to do graduate level work and he feels it's incredibly important for that purpose. So the website holisticadmissions.org. If you have not looked at this yet, I encourage you to do so. It is just full of wonderful information that you can use as you begin to think about how you would like to do holistic admissions how you might want to structure your own admissions process in a different way. It's got videos, it's got presentations, it's got downloadable resources. It just really is truly an extraordinary <clears throat> compilation of information in all different formats to help you make 
those decisions that you need to make as you're thinking about moving toward a more holistic review of applications. Just to highlight a couple of things, um, there's a one pager here on four facts about the GRE general test, which um, is there to help you think think about the general test and some facts with regard to it that may that you may or may may or may not um, may or may not know. Um, a flyer here about using GRE scores successfully, um, using holistic admissions. Um, scorecard, um, how you can um, review diligence and responsibility, just a variety of things here for you to take advantage of. And there is a digital guide now available on navigating holistic admissions, um, where all of the information that has been gathered from talking with deans uh, has been put together, um, including, you know, uh, thinking about mitigating unconscious bias. And it takes you through a variety of things to explore as you're trying to create a more holistic admissions process at your own institution. Here is just uh, you know, a sense of what's out there. There's a, an at-a-glance infographic. There's a, a, a guide PDF. There's even a PowerPoint with talking points that you can use as you are beginning to navigate uh, moving toward holistic admissions and um, trying to figure out how you're going to talk with your faculty uh, about this. One of the things that I think is most valuable on this site <coughs> is holisticadmissions.org slash be informed, which is shown here. This directly answers questions that many faculty have about validity, bias, how to mitigate um, group score differences, many of those things that I know a number of you out there are thinking about right now. Are the tests valid and reliable? And if so, why? Why do some people say the tests are biased? How can an admissions committee mitigate score variance between demographic groups? You know, ETS doesn't suggests there aren't score differences among demographic groups, but it does provide you with a way to mitigate um, those score differences. And they have nothing to do with the bias of the exam. They have everything to do with the different background that um, your applicants will bring to taking that exam. So a wonderful set of FAQs directly answering the questions that you most want to ask. Now, I do want to say, a few words about the value of the GRE exam and its validity. So we have already touched on the fact that every component of a student's application has bias and some have more bias than others. The GRE scores can be used in a way that they help mitigate the bias in the other components of the application. First of all, they offer a common objective measure um, that tends to level the playing field for the students. Every student took the same GRE exam. So it's a common objective measure of their preparation for graduate school. It provides evidence of their academic skills and graduate readiness through the verbal exam, the quantitative exam, and the writing exam. And it can balance the limitations of the other parts of the application that are used as part of the entire process. Remember, holistic admissions is about using everything you have available. In fact, the standardized test scores are the only part of the admissions file that goes through um, a rigorous fairness test. Um, that is part of what ETS brings to the process of developing the GRE exam. And without GRE scores as that normalizing factor, what else are you going to use? Um, one of your colleagues already you know, asked the question, what do we use when we're no longer using undergraduate GPA and no longer using GRE scores? What? And, and the answer is there's nothing else out there that's objective. And so you'll have to rely on your ability to make determinations from the information that you have because nothing else is objective. 
Um, but the GRE score can be used as that normalizing factor and has been used successfully by a number of programs. <clears throat> so the GRE score use guidelines, which are out there and you can find them at this website, um, they recommend multiple sources of information. Many of the things we talked about here this afternoon using multiple criteria that it's particularly important when assessing the abilities of educationally disadvantaged applicants. Cut scores should never be used. Don't evaluate applicants on the basis of very small differences in GRE scores. That was never the intention of the exam. And the verbal reasoning, the quantitative reasoning, and the analytical writing scores need to be considered as separate independent measures. A composite score for the three is never appropriate. Each one of those aspects of the general exam are providing different pieces of information. There is a blueprint out there for using the GRE as part of your holistic application process. There's a report that uh, came out last year by Miranda Wilson and a group at the University of Texas, MD Anderson. Um, and they carefully looked at holistic admissions and the role of the GRE in the process. And they concluded that it's the practice of using cut scores, not the GRE test itself, that disproportionately affects applicants from underrepresented groups. Um, certainly this is something that I have known for many years. It's not the GRE test, um, it's the use of the GRE test that creates problems um, in our admissions process and as indicated here, disproportionately affects applicants from underrepresented groups. The admissions committee can mitigate GRE score variances between the demographic groups. And this re um, report provides a nice blueprint of how to do that. A multi-tiered holistic applicant review process is what you need to increase the diversity of the applicant pool along with appropriate recruiting um, and ultimately the number of students within the program. So I would uh, recommend anybody who's moving toward holistic admissions to think about this resource and uh, read this particular report. It's really very well done and it will answer a lot of questions you may have on how do we do this? How do we mitigate the score variances between demographic groups? As we've said multiple times, all components of the application have imperfections, so they all have to be considered um, together and each have their own appropriate weight. Here is just an indication of how grades have inflated at schools over the years from 1983 to 2013. I mean, grade inflation has been just extraordinary um, over the years. And now we're entering a period of time where many schools are allowing their undergraduate students to choose pass fail as opposed to grades in courses as a way to relieve them of some of the anxiety they're feeling during this period um, of COVID-19. And that's gonna make it even more difficult to evaluate undergraduate GPAs such as they might, might exist. So don't provide them with undue weight. The GRE tests do have processes in place to minimize bias. I think again, this is one of those things that people may not appreciate about the GRETS and the GRE exam itself, but um, they, uh, the GRE ETS brings you know, incredible research and uh, capability and incredible capability in designing exam questions and evaluating the fairness of the exam questions to, their, uh, to the process of creating a test that is as fair and unbiased as it can possibly be. Uh, there are a range of checks and balances, including training the staff who's creating questions on the ETS standards, um, which are aligned with the best professional standards. Um, there are diverse teams to review test questions. 
there are procedures for removing questions that disadvantage or that seem to disadvantage any one group. So the GRE has really put a lot of effort into minimizing bias on the test. It doesn't mean there aren't differences between demographic groups, but those differences can be mitigated. And they're not because of the test itself. They have to, everything to do with the background the student brings into taking that exam. There are a number of studies out there that indicate that um, there is predictive validity associated with the GRE general test. Um, you can see the results of uh, a meta-analysis here of over 82,000 students indicating that the general test is a valid predictor of, of overall graduate GPA, if that's important to you, of comprehensive exam scores, of publication citation counts to a certain extent, of faculty ratings. Um, so it is a valid predictor of many of the things that we believe are important in graduate education. Should not be used alone um, to predict any one of those things. And there are a variety of resources out there all available at uh, the ETS website um, to think more carefully about the predictive validity of the GRE general test. The subject tests um, are even more predictive for those programs that uh, still utilize the subject test. They're even better predictors than the general test of whether or not a student uh, will succeed in a program. Now, I do want to share with you four cautions about evaluating some of the recent studies and reports that we see out there with regard to the GRE. Um, there are many, and um, in many cases, those studies have some methodological flaws that you need to think about as you're evaluating the studies. And the first would be insufficient sample size, um, which can often lead to incorrect conclusions. There are several of those studies out there which use a very small sample um, and arrive at probably an erroneous and incorrect conclusion based on a very small sample size. Another one that's incredibly important, and many of the studies, if not most of them, um, uh, have this flaw, and that's a restricted range um, and a failure to take that restricted range into account. So what we're talking about here is that most of the research that you see out there with regard to whether or not the GRE is predicting whatever you want it to predict, um, they're only looking at the students who got into the program. So think back to what I shared with you early on about UNC, where they took a look at how many publications a student had um, as a function of their GRE score and found that they weren't predictive. Well, that's a very restricted range since you're only looking at the students who got into the program. So you're already looking at the high flyers because they have gotten into your program. Um, an example of what a restricted range can do in terms of the R scores is provided here, just looking at grip strength. The important thing to take away here is that um, most of these studies have not taken the restricted range into account. And so there is a flaw in the methodology used in those studies. <laughs> in addition, um, many of the studies that are done want to attribute the lack of completion to um, something to do with the GRE score. Or the GRE score didn't predict whether or not this student will, would complete. Well, that's not very surprising in view of the fact that students fail to complete programs for a variety of reasons, most of which have nothing to do with academic ability. You can see uh, from this CGS study why many students, why many students drop out or are not retained in their graduate program. And the number one, the number one uh, reason is a change in family status that has nothing to do with their ability to complete the program or anything that the GRE might measure. So um, failure to complete is often um, erroneously attributed to the GRE. And then there are a lot of situations, particularly today, um, where there's lack of a true control in the study that's being done. The programs are doing all sorts of different things at the same time. 
and they want to attribute uh, any success they have to increasing diversity or increasing completion um, to the fact that they eliminated the GRE test, while in fact, they are also offering more financial support or changed their mentoring program or um, working on making the environment more inclusive, any number of things, all of which um, can have a positive impact on whether or not students complete. So we would certainly encourage you to do all those things. Don't make the assumption that it was dropping the GRE, that simple, um, that's a simple uh, easy thing to do that um, was the sole reason for your success. It, this is just a link of tools um, and uh, various websites you can go to for help in figuring out how to do holistic admissions. And then I wanna finish by saying just a couple of words about ETS's efforts to um, increase um, access and equity for, the app, for their applicants. First of all, the GRE program is working on this all the time. They were the first test, I believe, first standardized test to come out with the GRE general test at home. It was really a remarkable um, accomplishment and a tour de force. And, um, you know, they should be credited with um, recognizing that that was an important thing to do for graduate education and coming up with a way to do it very quickly. Many people are unaware of the GRE fee reduction program but there is a very robust fee reduction program available to students who have genuine um, financial need. And it reduces the cost of taking the test by half and at the same time provides a number of other um, aspects of preparing for the test at reduced or no cost. Um, so it really is a quite, uh, quite a robust program to help make cost less of a barrier to our students. There's absolutely outstanding free test prep out there. Um, I have recommended this to students for a number of years. It's, it's really, the students do not need to pay for a Kaplan course. Um, there is excellent free test prep. All they have to have is the diligence to do it. Um, and of course, ETS tries to, lead, tries to lead the industry in testing accommodations and in providing feedback on test performance. Um, all of these things are important aspects of what ETS is doing for the GRE, and I think underappreciated by the graduate community. And so I wanna finish by indicating that ETS is a nonprofit um, organization. Many people don't realize that. They believe that um, it is driven by profit, made by uh, charging for the GRE exam. Um, the reality is the GR, the, they are nonprofit and the um, funds they receive from administering the exam are plowed back into research done by the organization. Um, they develop and administer and score 50 million tests each year um, in more than 180 countries. It is the world's largest private educational assessment and research organization. And I want to stress that and research part. And they have a, a mission to advance um, quality and equity in education. Um, and they are making significant annual investments in solution to nine big educational challenges, which are shown here. And I will not read through these, but I will let you read these for, your, for yourself. So ETS is absolutely committed to working with the graduate education community to advance the quality of graduate education, to advance the inclusion aspect of graduate education, to advance the diversity of the student population in graduate education. And they very much wanna work with all of you to make that happen through holistic admissions, and as I said, through expanding what they have available um, to the graduate education com community to ensure um, everybody's success in this endeavor. And I am going to uh, stop sharing my slides at this point and ask if there are questions. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have about holistic admissions, about what ETS is doing. Matt is here to answer any questions that I can't answer about uh, specific processes at uh, ETS that I may not be familiar with. So 
questions. Dr. Matson, thank you. Questions to Dr. Matson and the ETS team, please. Uh, looking at the way uh, GRE is being uh, talked about in terms of not just waiving, but seeing that there is a need to revamp the test, is ETS seriously thinking of revamping the GRE to include to be more inclusive, especially in terms of uh, promoting the diversity that they are aiming for in the admissions documents? Matt, do you want to say anything about that? I mean, I, I know what I know, but... Is there anything you want to say? Yeah, I mean, the GRE in general goes through a, a variety of fairness uh, checks, you know, to make sure it doesn't disadvantage any one subpopulation or one uh, segment of the population. So uh, that's continuous. So I don't foresee anything, any radical changes in the near future. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I think the, um, you know, measurement experts that work with ETS that are part of uh, the ETS research group and measurement experts actually, frankly, around the world agree that the, the GRE test itself is not biased. Uh, it's as fair as it possibly can be. Um, however, students come into the exam with different experiences and therefore there can be some differences in how different groups, different demographic groups score um, but there are a number of ways to mitigate those differences now. And I think most people agree that there's no way, unless you revamp um, all of education, that you can absolutely eliminate those score differences because people bring different backgrounds, different educational opportunities uh, to the exam when they take it. Any other comments, questions uh, to the ETS team and Dr. Uh, Steve Matson? I have one. Um, why do you think that higher ed seems to be really polarized as far as qualitative versus quantitative? Like it, it either seems like we're all about the GPA and the GRE or we're about cutting them out. Well, so that's a <laughs> <laughs> it's a really interesting question. And I, I don't know that I have a, a great answer to that, but I, I have this feeling um, that we believe that we need to be doing something different and we're not sure what that something different is. And so I watch some groups who believe that if they eliminate the GRE and you know, become part of that, I'm not gonna look at the GRE group, that that will solve all of their problems. And the one thing that I have certainly um, learned during my time as graduate dean is there's no simple fix to any of this. If graduate admissions were simple, um, we would, uh, you know, we'd allow the graduate student to do the, the graduate school to do it centrally. Um, so I think people have become, you know, part of one camp or the other thinking that this is the only way to go. And we would make the argument that it is not either one of those, but it's a combination of the two. And that admitting the graduate class that you want is hard work. And I think for years we've thought it does not have to be hard work. But I have come to the conclusion that not only does it have to be hard work, but it has to be intentional work. You have to really decide what it is you're looking for and then go out and get it. It is not any longer simply going to fall from the sky. And it is not, in most cases, uh, I will know it when I see it. You have to really think about what each aspect of the application is bringing to the process. So it's work. So Dr. Matson, uh, just to provide you with some idea, we are a comprehensive regional master's institution and we have four doctoral programs uh, and we are not allowed to offer PhD programs. From your experiences in overseeing um, uh, the graduate school at UNC Chapel Hill, do you see, do you have some recommendations in particular for master's programs as opposed to PhD programs? that we must be mindful and thinking of as we are, uh, we embrace the idea of holistic admissions and we 
ask programs to reflect upon their practices and make suitable uh, changes. Yeah, I think in it's it's really about sitting down together and thinking about what it is you are trying to accomplish with your students. I think we often don't do that. Or we have done, we did it years ago and, and haven't done it again. Or we think we'll, um, when we see it, we'll know it um, rather than reflecting on it. So I go back to the experience that the ETS and GRE staff had when they went out to institutions and began to ask questions about admissions and the admissions committee, the deans, they all said, wow, we haven't thought about that in a long time or we have never thought about that. And I think it's, it's actually asking those questions. So I would suggest that each of those programs begin right there with that set of questions that were asked by the uh, GRE program staff to the admissions groups that they interviewed um, start right there and ask yourself those questions and see what comes of that particular exercise. I think that uh, the programs will find that they have a, a new thought about what they, a new set of thoughts about how they might want to approach admissions by simply doing that as a place to begin. Wonderful, thank you. Is there, do you see any differences in practices between let's say humanities disciplines and STEM disciplines? Is there a differences in philosophies you think? And this is coming back to what uh, Ms. Nikki Roof had talked about. And I hear this all the time from uh, science and engineering faculty is that they use GRE precisely because they have a large number of international applicants and that leveler if you will is that GRE exam because they do not know the strength and rigor of students coming from different programs. Do you have some guidance for broadly humanities and sciences? Well, I'm going to come back to what we have tried to talk about uh, the entire time, and that's using everything you have available and thinking about what's most important. So it's not unusual for some humanities programs to have a different set of goals for their students at the end of the day than some of the STEM programs. And so they'll place different weight on different aspects of the application. But I would still recommend that all aspects of the application, including GRE scores, um, be utilized um, in evaluating the applicants. It's there, I think it's a difference in how you weight them. It's very clear to me that many of the humanities programs are gonna want competent writers at the outset. Uh, whereas some of the STEM programs may be willing to develop that writing competence and not be as uh, concerned about it. And so there may be parts of the application that aren't there for STEM disciplines, but are there for humanities disciplines. So it's really, again, about thinking about what are your goals and settling on those goals, asking questions that may not have been asked by the program for many, many years. Wonderful. Any other comments? Our questions to Dr. Matson and the ETS team from the WKU campus community. Yes, Dr. Matson, um, how would you address or discuss with faculty in a professional licensure program where the majority of the research and the, and the thought process is that those quantitative variables are the variables that are gonna apply most towards licensure examination. Um, it's not the research, it's not the social skills, it's can they pass a licensure exam, which goes back to the objective structured GRE or maybe to a lesser extent undergraduate GPA that's gonna be the better predictors. So, um, you know, I have talked to a couple of professional programs um, not here at UNC, but elsewhere, who have found that you're, you're quite right, um, that the GRE is a better indicator of whether or not the students will actually be able to pass those licensure exams uh, <clears throat> than other aspects of the application. <clears throat> and there, I think it becomes important to provide appropriate weighting 
to the GRE versus other components of the application. And certainly I think I, I did, I talked to one program this past spring where they had decided to eliminate the GRE um, and their, the passing rate for licensure um, fell to such an extent that they became in trouble with their licensing organization and went back and took a look and discovered that the GRE was a pretty good predictor of whether or not the students had the skills that were necessary to succeed in the graduate program and ultimately pass the licensure exam. And so they went back and said, no, we've got to require the GRE. And we've got to let students know that this is an important component of the application and we got to appropriately evaluate it as part of the application. Does that help answer your question a little bit? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, this is Nikki. Sorry, I switched to myself. Um, just to oh. piggyback off of that, um, do you think that was indicative, the GRE was indicative of the licensure passing because of you know, an in, in, intrinsic skill that's being measured? Or do you think it was just because the GRE might have been showing the student is good at taking generalized tests and that might have spilled over to the licensure? So that actually, that's a pretty interesting question. I think the program would probably argue that it was measuring an intrinsic skill and not just that um, it was, uh, they were good at standardized tests, but I don't know that they did anything to actually look at that. That's a very interesting question. Um, I think they would argue that um, it had to do with intrinsic skills that the GRE was measuring. Do we have any further questions to Dr. Matson or uh, Matt? Well, it's uh, two minutes past 4.30 p.m. Dr. Matson. On behalf of the Western community, we want to extend our gratitude. Uh, uh, it's clear that you have a passion for graduate education and this continues even after returning back to the faculty uh, uh, role. And uh, we are thankful uh, ETS uh, as well, uh, Ms. Catherine Schultz and uh, Mr. Matt bashi Kadlubowski. We are deeply grateful to ETS. Uh, we are looking forward to our continued collaboration uh, to engage with the graduate uh, community folks here at Western and uh, provide tools uh, for innovation and promote excellence. Uh, Western faculty and staff, thank you so much for your attendance and participation. And I'm also grateful to Dr. Scott Gordon in the Graduate School Office for all the logistics and help and support in creating the Zoom session. So again, we this is part of our effort to bring about innovation and excellence uh, from external constituents and practitioners bringing uh, and talking about evidence-based practices that have worked. And so it is a, an opportunity for us to uh, use the information that we have received today. Uh, and we'll share the presentation and the PowerPoint uh, with the rest of the campus and reflect upon our own uh, admission uh, policies, standards and practices. Thank you one, one and all and have a wonderful uh, rest of the afternoon and evening. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much.